my name is Rachel Willey and I'm here in my capacity as Honorary Secretary of the Society for Renaissance Studies to welcome you to the launch of Shakespeare and East Asia. Now, I will be brief as I know that you're here to celebrate the achievements of Alexa and hear what she and Mark have to say, rather than me with her on. So we're aiming for the live streaming of this session to last about an hour, but Alexa has kindly agreed to loiter in the chat afterwards and after the live streaming for any follow-ups. So if any of you want to try to replicate the warm wine post seminar drink vibe, then you're welcome to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. Well, welcome everyone to the book launch of Alexa Alice Jubin's wonderful new book, Shakespeare and East Asia, Oxford University Press, which examines Shakespeare's multiple meanings in a variety of Asian contexts for the first time, revealing deep connections between Asian and Anglo-American cinematic and theatrical traditions. Before I go any further, let me mention that there will be a book giveaway sponsored by Oxford University Press. So stay with us and you might be lucky. My thanks to Dr. Rachel Willey, Liverpool John Morse University for coordinating this event and also to the Society for Renaissance Studies for their imprimatur and support. Alexa Alice Jubin is Professor of English, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, International Affairs, Theatre and East Asian Languages and Cultures and founding co-director of the Digital Humanities Institute at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. In addition to the book we're launching today, she's written and edited a number of other books, including Race, published as part of Routledge New Critical Idiom Series and co-authored with Martin Orkin. She has also edited Local and Global Myths in Shakespearean Performance, co-edited with Aneta Mankiewicz, 2018, and Shakespeare and the Ethics of Appropriation, co-edited with Elizabeth Rifkin, 2014. First, we're going to hear a presentation on Shakespeare in East Asia by Alexa. There will then be a couple of questions from myself. Then we'll open up discussion to everyone present. We should be done by six o'clock, but there'll be an informal opportunity after that for chat and conversation. Alexa. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Rachel, as well as Society for Renaissance Studies for making this possible. Thank you all for joining us from so many different parts of the world. I feel really touched and really fortunate to be in your company. I want to thank Oxford University Press for not only sharing the book through fruition, but actually sponsoring a book giveaway today. It's so very special to see you. Um, I have a very short presentation uh, along with uh, one or two interesting clips from wonderful, witty, brilliant comedy films that I want to share with you. And Rachel would uh, play those on my behalf. And um, I would also talk about the special features of the book um, at, a, at a later point. Since the 19th century, stage and film directors have mounted hundreds of adaptations of Shakespeare. Many of these are drawn on East Asian motifs, and they don't always originate in East Asia. By the late 20th century, Shakespeare had become one of the most frequently performed playwrights throughout East Asia in Japan, Korea, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, even Tibet, as well as Singapore. And I'm here to tell you five fascinating things about East Asian Shakespeare, including how gender pronouns are reinvented to construct new gender identities in these adaptations, and how they recruited Shakespeare for socially reparative purposes. There are also transgender performances, in particular, a high profile transgender film from South Korea. And these adaptations also teach us to listen for racial differences, not just seeing race, but listening for race. Last but not least, they reveal deep connections among theater, manga, film, and other genres, as well as among cultures. So word choices, we know words matter. Word choices in East Asian films reveal 
or sometimes conceal how much power a character might have over others. In Akira Kurosawa's film Throne of Blood, for example, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth address each other with formal and informal pronouns that betray their unease and desire to control. Unfortunately, this feature um, has been neglected by, uh, by, by, most, by most people because they don't come through in translation. So that's the blessing and curse of subtitles. For example, what stands out in the film is how and when some characters choose informal language when conversing with when conversing with each other, Macbeth and Banquo, for example, refer to each other with first names, deepen their voice, and use the informal language, and especially the informal masculine pronoun ore in Japanese. Washizu attempts Washizu, the Macbeth figure, attempts to create a similarly intimate bond with his wife in private, but she rejects his attempts and maintains verbal and physical distance. It is notable that when Macbeth addresses Lady Macbeth, he does not use any honorific. He does not address her as Suma, uh, meaning wife, or Okusan, lady of the house. Meanwhile, Lady Macbeth uses the most formal singular first-person pronoun, watakushi, rather than the informal feminine atashi which would be what a private conversation between a husband and wife would normally be. And so th these are just some, some quick examples of the fascinating, um, the, the, the fascinating uh, new gender dynam dynamics that can emerge in translation. I've always said that we should work with translation rather work, than work, work with translation than kind of working to erase the translational effect. So there's another intriguing example, Twelfth Night. In this all-female Takarazuka musical production, um, we have Viola, who's disguised as page boy Cesario, and of course she finds herself pursued by the love lord Duchess Olivia. Um, she declares, I am the man. She were better love a dream. She speaks with double irony. Um, even in early modern times, Viola would speak with double irony as a doubly cross-dressed boy actor on, on the English stage. For example, Nathan Fields, um, who was active in the late 16th century, um, in the all-female production, Viola would embody a new form of gender fluidity. In Kimura Shinji's 1999 production, um, as we see here, Viola was placed by an otokoyaku. And an actress specializing in presenting, quote, sensitive masculinity of idealized male characters. So Viola Cesario here um, is interesting in this context. It's almost all female production, right? So Cesario was not the only cross-dressed character. Um, the Japanese language is especially rich because Japanese often enlightens the subject. Um, in addition to making the right choice of employing the familiar um, or the polite register based on the relationship between the speaker and the addressee, um, male and female speakers would uh, be restricted by the gender specific first person pronouns available to them. So in other words, gender code switching creates semantic ambiguity and double irony. I would say syntactical limitations actually create linguistic opportunities in articulating anew all of these complex gender dynamics in Shakespeare. Now, does Shakespeare always come to rescue? To rescue people from backward culture? Not always. Some adaptations offer a corrective to Shakespeare's plays, such as Sherwood Hu's Tibetan film, Prince of the Himalayas, which came out in 2006. It was shot and filmed in Tibet with a Tibetan cast speaking Tibetan. The film gives Ophelia, as we see here, a, an active role through a remedial view of the dramatic action, whereas Shakespeare's Gertrude um, casts Ophelia as, quote, mermaid-like, uh, really a fairy tale creature, um, who is very passive. The Ophelia here in this film becomes a goddess of nature and an immortal bride who returns to nature. So that's one kind of reparative work. They, they stay corrective, right? Especially to female characters who are traditionally silent. But there are other works. Other works mock the conviction that Shakespeare has any recuperative function in the society. 
For example, the Hong Kong comedy film One Husband Too Many. So this is a screenshot here, and we'll get to see a clip soon. This is directed by Anthony Chan in 1988, 10 years before Hong Kong returned uh, to China. Well, the canonical status of Shakespeare's oeuvre has led to admiration and deference. There has been many witty parodies of the tragedy since the 1980s. This film dramatizes its character's near chaotic insistence on performing and rehearsing Romeo and Juliet to ameliorate their conditions. Here you see uh, the, the, the male lead, he, he pins all his hope on bringing Western culture to, quote, a backward village in Hong Kong. And um, he's really passionate about staging his version of Romeo and Juliet as they imagine um, the Western culture, uh, how, 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 what the Western culture looks like. And especially interesting is here is, is the, the film, um, specifically parodies the Italian filmmaker Franco Zeffirelli's film version. And you can see the costumes and even a soundtrack, A Time for Us, is borrowed from Zeffirelli for parodic purposes. So he takes on the role of Romeo and his wife plays Julia as we see here. Ta 我仍然在黑布大衣般的地狱毛我该怎么办老大现在演的是罗密欧与朱丽叶又不是演as you can see, the audiences are disruptive, no doubt, uh, among our our audiences at the launch here, you will probably recognize uh, references to others as well. Um, the, 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 the Italian film, What Are the Clouds, for example, it's a play within a film, staging Othello, the audiences storm the stage. Um, the, the, I, I, I have a whole chapter where I examine parodies like this. They are clever and they participate in the global flow of culture in its very unique way. So it's not just um, here shakes the story, let us retell it to an audience who speaks a different language. So transgender performance is, is the next is the third fascinating thing about global adaptations. In the 1990s, to help change the image of South Korea abroad, the government began sponsoring the production of film and theater works. And within this context of democratization, um, I hope there's no feedback as I speak. Rachel, if you turn off your, it's the, the setting you needed to play the clip, I believe. 
within the context of the democratization of society, um, several South Korean adaptations, especially of Hamlet, they recast Ophelia as a shaman who serve as a medium to counsel the dead and guide the living because female shamans exist outside the Confucian social structure that have greater agency. Inspired by political and academic feminism, these works result the position of Korean women in society. Ophelia has been appropriate as a feminist symbol, but Ophelia is also a site of contestation over gender identities. That's where the king and the clown comes in. The 2005 feature film, The King and Account, it actually uh, grossed more than the Titanic. It's a major hit in South Korea. It really brought gender nonconformity into public discourse. Uh, so this film depicts the erotic entanglement among a king and two acrobatic street performers. There's the macho, Jang Song, who plays male roles, and there's the trans feminine, Gong Ji, who shares several personality traits with Ophelia, Hamlet's love interest. And Ophelia and Gongji, as you see on the left here, uh, they both are unable to express themselves and their life is largely determined by men around them. The transgender Ophelia character draws on the local culture of flower boys or Koki Minon. The, the, the term flower boy refers to male identifying singer or actor known for the use of makeup and mannerisms that are considered socially to be feminine. Female fans live vicariously through androgynous characters like these without fear of being stigmatized as being promis promiscuous. So it's interesting that, that Flower Boys, the famous um, uh, Korean boy band BTS, you may have heard of, is a good example. They have, they have largely female fan base, bases. And the, the fans may have lesbian tendencies where they may be desiring ideal heterosexual men who rarely exist in reality. I think this is a really interesting um, point here. More research should be done in comparing the flower boys in modern times to early modern boy actors, for example. I've started a bit of that work in my book, in my next book with Cambridge University Press, staging transgender Shakespeare on screen. Um, I delve much deeper into this phenomenon. A scene in court here, you see, bears diagnostic significance regarding Ophelia's trans femininity. So our trans Ophelia here, um, she she has uh, she has garnered the, the favor of the king in white and in, in, in the right. In the middle, uh, storming in is a courtesan. She's very jealous of this trans Ophelia um, and taunt. She comes in to taunt Ophelia about about her real gender. The thing points to voyeuristic. Uh, a voyeuristic desire anchored in anatomy as an index to some truth about gender. The courtesan tries to undress the trans Ophelia in front of the king, creating a great deal of tension. And as you see in this, uh, this in, the, in the next scene, when she's intimate with the king, she actually asks again, is he really a man? referring to our Ophelia figure. Presumably her dramatic act of gender revelation is to expose Ophelia as an abject subject with alleged physical deficiencies and thereby dissuade the king from bestowing further favors on Ophelia. So she's trying to up the ante, right, in this competition. Such revelation scenes are a familiar device in transgender films, a device of exposure that subject trans characters to extra scrutiny. Beyond gender, there's, of course, race. So race and ethnicity are not only visible, but audible in the multi in multilingual films. Um, there are many examples uh, discussed in the book. A, a, a good example is a Singaporean film called Chicken Rice War, directed by Chi Chong, Chi Kong Che, uh, which came out in 2000. Built around the conceit of a college production of Romeo and Juliet, the film trivializes the feud in Romeo and Juliet by reducing the generational dispute to the rivalry between the Wongs and the Chan families who own competing chicken rice stalls. The film 
uses multilingualism as both a dramatic device and a political metaphor. The elder generation converse in Cantonese, whilst the younger generation speak mostly Singlish or Singaporean English, but all characters uh, at some point, they all mix different languages. So this is a beautiful multilingual film with a lot of accents and has a huge implication for accent studies. Here you see on the poster, Fenson and Audrey, um, the, 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 the two main characters who end up playing Romeo and Juliet. In a mix of English and Cantonese, um, the two perform the balcony scene in which Romeo and Juliet meet after the masked ball. Meanwhile, their offstage parents become more and more impatient with the public display of affection. The parents do not understand the boundary between playmaking and playgoing. The parents are emotionally detached from an intellectually excluded by the younger generation's Anglophone education, right? And this is symbolized, symbolized uh, the, the education is actually symbolized and, and lampooned by their unsuccessful production of Romeo and Juliet. This is, um, this is uh, Fenton's father, right? Staring at all the chickens. Uh, they, they have a very witty reworking of the prologue from Shakespeare, um, targeting Bad Lerman's famous film, Romeo plus Juliet. Um, it's specifically to, to parody that film, all of the tropes. Um, and so this film actually opens with a TV news anchor as well, um, reading the prologue with the, with a twist. Um, where, where in, whereas in Shakespeare and Lerman, blood is shed. Here, um, no blood is shed other than that of the chicken. Two families, both alike in dignity and profession, in fair Ang Mo Kyo, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge led to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers choose their chicken rights. What are you saying? Do you think Mr. Tan and Amo Kyo can understand you? When I told you not to speak in English, I didn't ask you to sound like Shakespeare. Do it again! Do it again! <laughs> so bold as to ask for a chance to read Romeo. What makes you think that you can be Romeo? What makes you think you can play Romeo? You don't have the looks and you can't even speak properly. Nick, on the other hand, he looks like Leonardo DiCaprio. That's why he's Romeo. Do you think you look like Leonardo? Yeah, I agree. So the clip shows us, obviously, when they mention Leonardo DiCaprio, that's just a really, uh, that's a really um, targeted parody uh, against uh, Lerman. Lerman's film has reached such global uh, notoriety or um, reputation, shall we say. I think Mr. Lerman should be very proud. When people started parodying you, it means you've made it. So Singapore's propaganda emphasizes commercial cosmopolitanism, as you can see uh, in the film, everything that the film is critiquing. There's this uh, repackaged idea of transnational history of immigration in Singapore in the service of economic growth. Chicken Rights War critiques the ideas that a sounding white speaking standard English conveys more authority. Right, throughout, um, the idea is, kept, is brought up multiple times, but then every time characters will do that to sound white, they actually become the butt of the joke. So, um, moving right along here, uh, we're coming back to my site. There are deep connections, I have, as we've seen, among Asian and Anglophone performance cultures. So one of the points I'm making in the book is that uh, people tend to think, oh, Shakespeare in an exotic culture, maybe 
it's just an isolated case. It is no, you know, nothing to do with mainstream. Actually, has everything to do with the so-called mainstream performances. The narrative structure of Akira Kurosawa's films, for example, has provided inspiration for Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, and George Lucas. Here is a a, a photo from 1980 where where Lucas and, Akur, and Kurosawa actually met in California, and uh, Lucas is showing Kurosawa a model of Snow Speeder from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. If you look at the Star Wars um, franchise, you realize that both filmmakers tell story in the same way. They, they, they put you, um, Kurosawa, for example, uh, begins his films in media's rest and offers the net of epic history. In Throne of Blood, we are introduced to the Macbeth figure as he gallops with Banquo through the thickets of the iconic spider's web forest. Characterized by webs of tangled branches, strong verticals of tree trunks, um, and heavy rain, the scene draws us in with its perfectly lateral, fast tracking shots. Similarly, George Lucas begins the Star Wars with Princess Leia, battling the troops of Darth Vader, plunging audiences into action, already unfolding before the start of the film. Lucas and Kurosawa share the same narrative strategy of reaching for the general through the specific. Now, Chicken Rice War pointedly parodies Bud Lerman's campy film adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. So that's a different kind of deep connection. Lerman's film opens with uh, the composed, dispassionate, deliberately old-fashioned script reading by a female TV news anchor, as you see here on the slide, and this is framed by an antiquated television set. This is followed by voice of male announcer in a solemn tone against live action shots uh, and an operatic soundtrack. In Chicken Rice War, the clip we just saw, the reflexive role of the chorus is actually split between the English-speaking newscaster I mean, uh, who speaks Singaporean English and is criticized by, by his, by his supervisor, right? Um, he opens the phone and then there's the Malay character who sings a version of the prologue as Cantonese opera at her beverage store, as we've seen. So these features, uh, assume the audience of familiarity, not only with Romeo and Juliet, but specific with Bad Roman. The aforementioned Hong Kong comedy film, one Husband Too Many. Features costumes reminiscent of Danilo Donati's doublet and tights designed for Franco Zeffirelli's 1968 film, Romeo and Juliet, to the tune of the film's A Time for Us by Nino Rota with new Cantonese lyrics. There are many more examples. Uh, Michael Almerida, for example, appropriates Asian spirituality in his Buddhist inflected film Hamlet, which came out in 2000. And that film is set in 21st century Manhattan. The Vietnamese monk Hich Nang Ha is featured in a spin off of the to be or not to be speech where he talks about interbeing, not just to be. So all of these are just examples. And um, my book, it's not about Shakespeare in East Asia, but Shakespeare and East Asia, the interplay, but also deep connections like this. Um, Edgar Wright, for example, Hot Fuzz, uh, it, it parodies Bad Roman as well, and it places that uh, in conjunction with films like Chicken Rice War. So what do the deep connections teach us? What do all of these examples tell us? So first of all, the deep connections among adaptations that, that go through different media and genres, um, a lot of the works we discuss here are, are results of metacinematic and metatheatrical experimentations. Um, that's why I, I wanted to bring film and theater together. Multilingual films such as Chicken Rice War conquer the narratives about universal literary experiences. Uh, they compel us to work with rather than work out of the space between languages. So, uh, one lesson that, that, that I've uh, distilled is that it's more productive to work with rather than work out of the space between languages, the translational space. I, I noticed how subtitles, as I said before, can erase differences, but subtitles can also recognize differences with an eye toward equality. There are deep connections among adaptations from different cultures, and this is where 
Um, the last point comes in what I call compulsory real politic. This is a conviction uh, in the West, especially among journalists, that a conviction that the best way to understand non-Western work is by interpreting their engagement with pragmatic politics. The approach may imply that non-Western works are of interest solely because of testimonial value. And uh, it has a lot of uh, implications for, for race studies today. Compulsory realpolitik could imply that works from the global south or Asia, um, they only operate as national allegories. They are valuable only for their political messages or for their testimonial value. Um, people end up asking questions like, why are there so many global Shakespeare adaptations in cultures who have no love for Great Britain? In my mind, that is the wrong question. It's not about it's not about the UK as a political entity. Uh, it's rather about the international cultural flow. And uh, repeatedly, we have seen in, in, in criticism right, of global Shakespeare, non-white authors, uh, they assume to be, pink, to be giving their work some ethnic meanings, right? Um, and white Western examples are assumed to have more external power. They are more important. And so examples from Global South, they're always footnotes. They, they are there to, to, um, to, to prop up a theory, for example, um, and that's what I was contending against. I believe that Asian Shakespeare give us a category that we can use to develop site-specific critical vocabulary to address some of these blind spots. Um, the story of Asian performance is not and should not always be political. Of course, stories of political oppression must be told, but dichotomized views do not get us very far. And I share with you my email here. Feel free to uh, get in touch and I would love to hear from you. Even my dog, when the books arrived the other day, uh, was reading the book, um, fostering uh, a pandemic puppy, really hope to, uh, to, to, to have a few fam family members. So even if that be approved, perhaps you would consider giving the book a read. And um, I understand there are questions coming up, but uh, here is uh, what I mentioned earlier. That one of the special features is this, the, the table of contents, which is, which is uh, concise, but the alternative table of contents gives you uh, a, a, a bird's eye view of which play I will discuss in which chapter, and specifically what kind of media, I mean, uh, as well as the names of the key directors. Alexa, thank you so much. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you for those fascinating insights into Shakespeare in East Asia. Uh, very pertinent that you've shown us your table of contents there, because that was actually my first question. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on your method of organisation. For example, you don't go for artists, you don't really go for auteurs, uh, you don't really go for nations, but you go for something altogether rather more suggestive and different. Thank you, Mark. That is a very pertinent question indeed. Methodology. So working across genres, this is a book about film and theater and across so many cultures. Of course, it poses the challenge of how we will organize this material. And I, I ended up settling on this idea of themes. Um, as you can see, there are four chapters and they're organized by themes. The first one is a, so they form concentric circles. I begin with formalistic analysis, because as I said before, the subtitles are really important, right? So I delve into the kind of work to, as a corrective to, to contemporary scholarship on um, non-anglophone adaptations that tend to just look at the visuals and would ignore the, ignore the language. The examples I gave, 12th night, right? Importance of linguistic ambiguity, um, as well as innovations in Akira Kurosawa and Yukio Ninagawa's uses of music, sound, and silence, as well as their visual framing devices. So the first chapter is organized around form. So formalistic innovations that kind of carry out a, a um, part of my wish is that this book would be, would be teachable, would be useful in the classroom. So I'm showing students 
um, how to carry out formalistic analysis. And building upon that, we start to go out. So these are concentric circles. We begin to talk about politics. And the second chapter talks about reparation, how adaptations engage in social reparation to, to use literature for reparative purposes. So there are two types. One is more serious. They, they really invested and believe that, that performing Shakespeare makes you a better person. And the other, of course, they parody that. They, they, they mock them. They, they say there's no such thing. Um, so one husband too many, for example, very pointedly parody this kind of idea in reparation. Um, and, and so it's an ideological analysis. From there, we build out to chapter three about reception. So I offer um, a reception theory and many examples about how to uh, do a metacritical reading. So multiple films and, and productions, especially those who tour, right? Um, and, and you look at, look at the, by polyphonic, I meant the, the many different conflicting voices of the directors, the, the, the actors, the audiences, the journalists. Um, and, and so, as you can see, it's a, it's a series of concentric circles. You, you move further and further out from formalistic to ideological criticism and eventually arrive at chapter four, um, um, multilingualism and, and a diaspora, uh, um, film and theater on the move. So that's where we get into Asian American theater, as well as the British Asian theater um, and, and theaters and films that tour and what are their fates, especially the use of so many different languages. And I've given you a taste of this. I decided to organize this way because I think it's more productive. It's methodologically organized rather than by region, by country, by, by artist, even though underneath it is still um, organized more or less in that way, just so that it's not too dizzy a ride. I understand it's a dizzy ride. So chapter one, largely Japanese examples. Chapter two, largely Sinophone Chinese examples. Chapter three is Korean. Chapter four, well, it's multilingual, but a lot of the artists originated in Singapore, even if they don't do the work, do the work in Singapore. So that's that's the that's the idea. Um, and the alternative table of contents is meant to give you a more detailed map of, of the names of artists and so on. Back to you, Mark. That's really illuminating, Alexa. Thank you very much. And that kind of brings me on to the next question as well, which is you do cover a great number of examples, uh, Shakespeare from Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, China, Korea, Taiwan, Tibet, and elsewhere. How do you theorize your content for example, in your introduction, you mentioned exchange, uh, the rise home, deterritorialization, transnationalism. There are a number of contentions, as I mentioned before, primarily I'm working. All right. So there are things I'm working against and things I'm working with. I'm working mm -hmm. against with this assumption of compulsory real politic, um, relative valuation of non-English adaptations. And the theory I came up with, of course, uh, am among, among others, this idea of deterritorialization, which means that uh, uh, when, when, when people encounter artworks, right, that, that originate, that require a label. Um, a book on, on English, performances of Shakespeare in the UK typically would not need the adjective English in the title. Um, but a book such as mine would always require specification. That it in itself, of course, is a bias of how the academia is set up. But um, the, 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 the realpolitik, compulsory realpolitik really dictates people's reactions when they see something, say, out of Asia, they would like to know um, what the artist ethnic position would be, what kind of message are we learning about um, political oppression. All of these topics are really important. But I deliberately spend time uh, on formalistic analysis, for example, show people the riches that they are missing. Um, if you only focus on one kind of message. So deterritorialization would mean that you recognize that artworks that circulate um, much like currency. And so they are not always, and sometimes artists actively resist that. 
they, they say, they look at me, I, I am this artist, I'm so and so, I, I'm not a, a spokesperson for a country that is boring, but look at me, it's my work. And uh, so there's a lot of that in artists, in, in directors I interviewed, very, um, very much, I, I, it's understandable, right? They, 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 they give us all these fascinating works, why do you only pay attention to Japanese tradition? Pay attention to Ninagawa, I'm Ninagawa, for example. In fact, there's nothing authentically Japanese in Ninagawa. There's a lot of things authentically Ninagawa in his work, right? So it's, it's very unique. And that's what, that's an example of deterritorialization because um, it's no longer uh, territorial in the sense of that it's married to the soil of Japan and it's, and it's giving us this beautiful cherry blossom wherever it goes. So that's, that's kind of what I'm, working against and what I'm working with, of course, is the deep connections that I discovered. So I allow new theories to grow organically out of my examples rather than simply um, taking their lures or like, and, you know, this book is is an exemplific exemplification of the lures theory with Asian examples as footnote. That's what I set out not to do. That's terrific. Thank you, Alexa. Really revealing. Uh, I have other questions, but I'm going to prevent myself from asking them because I know that people are very keen to ask you questions themselves and we already have one in the ask a question box and this is from Philip Parr so I'll just mediate that. So Philip asks, thank you for a fascinating presentation for such detailed observations on the subject. You've chosen many examples from film which stretch and explore Shakespeare. Do you think that theatre makers in East Asia take the same approach with stage performance? They they don't take the same approaches. It really comes down to what messages they wish to convey. Um, there are, let's see, um, in, in the chat, someone mentioned this deep interest in King Lear, right? There are a lot of Lear um, adaptations coming up and each one is unique in their own way. Uh, <sighs> I would say the the directors in terms of in terms of theater directors they would adjust their approach depending on if they are touring and I have repeatedly seen this which is a pattern Yukio Ninagawa um, who passed away a few years ago has been the the guru um, of of modern Japanese theater um, he would do he will have different productions of the same play like Othello for example and they look completely different if it's uh, if it's staged locally within Japan versus if it's touring to the UK. And that is a good example of how um, sometimes directors, they've been critiqued for this, right? But I think it's understandable how they want to adapt to the context to speak to the international audiences versus speaking to the Japanese audiences. He's, he's Othello meant for, for local audience, audiences in Tokyo um offered western costumes and kind of a more whatever theme was deemed exotic for the local audiences while if he toured to the uk it looked quite different very often we incorporate more japanese elements from no and kabuki for example um, though i have to say uh, exoticism shouldn't be the benchmark because no and kabuki are themselves exotic to modern japanese audiences who are more familiar with olive hollywood conventions um, so it is difficult to say if they take the same approach not at all um, and among them um, you have japanese korean sinophone singaporean directors there's also the question of uh, what is their what is what is their chosen genre is it uh, quote more traditional theater or is it kind of more modern theater? Singapore's Ong Kim Sen, for example, very often incorporates video work, um, dance. He's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's very innovative in terms of reinventing the modern theatrical forms of expression versus uh, Nirangawa who really likes to incorporate no and Kabuki into his works, even if it's a quote, what we call modern dress uh, presentation. So there's no single approach that they all share. And sometimes uh, they, they are, they are um, in theater works, we, we find fewer comedies. That's one thing I can say. The, 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 I'm sorry, the parodies, parodies. The, the parodies are 
in the cinematic format. Uh, one has been to many chicken rice war and there are many others. Uh, trivial wife, Mark, of course, writes extensively about Shakespearean world cinema. You probably noticed some of these trends. Um, so less in theater, but more in film. They would, they would use film as a medium to parody world culture. This is probably because of the assumed global circulation of film as a product. Alexa, you speak in the book about phases of global Shakespeare. Um, where do you see Shakespeare, global Shakespeare going in the future? Um, I, I, I see it going more global and eventually we can get rid of that label global. As I mentioned, yeah. the politics of the politics of unmarked versus marked identities very much at work in academia. Certain works are unmarked because they are the default, they quote speak to the mainstream, for example, mm -hmm. but anything global, you always have to mark it global, meaning that it is different. Um, sometimes, uh, God forbid, there's the assumption they're less important. It's, it's a bit of a, uh, harmless hobby of, 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 of some people who wish to engage in that little field. I very much see that changing with the, actually, if anything, the, the, the pandemic has taught us is that there's this acceleration of, of things going viral because due, due to the global lockdown, which we are still in right now, right? Um, ideas and, and performances circulate even faster in digital forms. And the silver lining coming out of this is that while we are we are we're staying in place, sheltering in place due to the pandemic, actually people's minds wander even more, much more than before. I think previously, um, perhaps it is more typical to just go to a go to a play, go to a theater, wherever you happen to be, right? Um, traveling requires a lot of privileges and resources but now um theater companies um and and even even films on various platforms they're opening up to the idea of yeah. of um market share being more important yeah. than yeah. Uh, meaning market share in the form of influence so yeah. certain things are circulating um at a low cost or or free I, I am working on a new project on this. What is happening to the arts during the pandemic? You know, what is the influence of yeah. the digital? So I, I see the, the digital slowly but surely changing the field of global Shakespeare. People will learn to appreciate all the echoes, echoes yeah. of King Lear. Yeah. If I tell you a story, for example, um, Korean folklore, one day, one day the parents call in their three daughters one by one and ask them, Ask them uh, to whom they owe their good fortune. The first and second daughters answer they owe their happiness to their parents, and the parents are very pleased. Uh, the third daughter, however, is honest and says that they owe their fortune to heaven. Um, she's disowned by the parents, unfortunately. And, and, and one day the parents trip on their door sill and lose their sight, so it becomes blind, um, and they are reduced to wandering beggars. Eventually, they are united with a younger daughter who happens to set up a feast for beggars. She forgives her parents and provides for them. I am not telling King Lear. I'm not telling you King Lear. I swear, this is actually a Korean, Korean shaman narrative, Shangong Bonpuri, um, or Bari Deji, Princess Bari, and yet. The structure is there. I'm sure when I was telling that story, you, you all hear echoes. I find that might be the future of global Shakespeare's when people begin to hear uh, attenuated references, unintended echoes like that. And of course, later on, a Korean adaptation drew on that folklore and brought King Lear and Bari Deji princes together. Mm -hmm. But when I was telling the story, I'm sure you, you will keep hearing King Lear, isn't it? Parents and three daughters and a third is home. What are we hearing? But that's the fascinating thing for me on this global journey. Um, I hear these echoes and I try to make sense of them. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Alexa. Now we've got six questions. So uh, I'm going to go to uh, Jay Jones, who asks, can you talk a little more about the difference between Shakespeare in East Asia and Shakespeare? and East Asia. Excellent. 
So the book, this title, Shakespeare and East Asia, rather than Shakespeare in East Asia, first of all, because of the deep connections I mentioned, the examples do not come only from, only uh, from within East Asia, um, because I analyze Asian American theater, British Asian theater, um, the, the global reception of Korean films performed in Bremen and, and Bremen, Berlin, and London, Edinburgh, for example. So that's the, the most lo logistic, pragmatic answer. But uh, ideologically, there's a big difference. Shakespeare in India, Shakespeare in Japan, Shakespeare in East Asia sometimes has been used as unproductive shorthand for, um, for, for kind of, it's a form of national profiling, uh, tacky Shakespeare. Um, and I want to avoid that, um, avoid cherry blossom Shakespeare gotta be Japanese. So I, I, I'm, I'm analyzing the interplay of Shakespeare and East Asia as two symbols. How do they, how do they um, make fireworks? Terrific, Alexa, thank you. Now, Jose Ramon Diaz Fernandez asks a question, which is, uh, Alexa, do you examine the animated series Romeo x Juliet in your volume? It is in a footnote. Um, when you get the book, Go dig for the treasure, the Easter egg. It is in a footnote, but I, I, I do mention, I actually mentioned Rangma as well. Uh, this, I, I think it's a transgender story. It's, 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 it's this boy who would randomly change into, into a girl and his father would change into a panda. Uh, so anime is on my radar, but obviously the book is about theater and film. So I, I do reference some of these and there's a chronology as well. That's another special feature of the book, chronology of, of major historical events versus major Shakespeare events, so you can find all the information there. Okay. Uh, G. Go comes in with a question. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Alexa. I wonder if you could comment on the role new of new media in the performances of Shakespeare in East Asia. It provides an additional layer. A good example is the aforementioned Singaporean director, Ong Kin Sen, who has, um, who has an adaptation called Desdemona, um, it's a retelling of the Othello story, but not chronological from Desdemona's perspective and interesting Desdemona um, as a punishment of, of Othello, right? Now, Desdemona comes back as a ghost to haunt Othello, turns Othello into a woman and Desdemona inhabits his body and simultaneously we have we have a digital screen it's both pre-recorded and live it's it's another actress performing backstage so the the interplay there is quite uh, distracting to some audiences but i find it innovative in, in in by offering multiple channels so obviously as an audience there you can't catch both the screen and the live action there, you may have to make a choice at some point. That to me is interesting. So a performance is now a museum with many doors and each person would come out with a different story in their head. Super, many thanks. We probably have time for just one more question before the uh, more informal chat. And this is from Natalia Kamenko, who asks, I was very intrigued by Juliet in One Husband Too Many, saying that she will take off her ugly aristocratic outfit. This is obviously a much longer conversation, but I was wondering if you could briefly comment on the use of class in East Asian adaptations of Shakespeare. Wonderful, thank you, Natalia. Indeed, in that failed performance, of uh, Zephyr Reilly style stage performance of Romeo and Juliet, that Julia wishes to take off her ugly aristocratic outfit um, as if to inch closer to their rogue villager audiences. And at, at that point, did you notice all the villagers, largely male, they said, oh, oh, uh, this is, let, let us quiet down because the real show is about to start. They, they're expecting pornographic kind of uh, strip tease and they all sit down in unison. That's, that's part of the comic effect. Class in East Asian adaptations feature uh, very importantly, but largely articulated through accents and race, like the example I gave in terms of uh, through Chicken Rice War, for example. Much more to talk about. If you get my book, you go to the index and you can look up class and jump to all the relevant sections. Great. Um, we're close to six o'clock now, so it only remain, remains for me to say uh, thank you very much indeed. Alexa, for this revelatory account of Shakespeare in East Asia. We're all going to enjoy your book immensely. Uh, thank you to the Society for Renaissance Studies 
and thank you to all you participants from around the world for attending. I think uh, Rachel is just going to say a few final words before we go to our informal chat. So, Rachel, over to yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, the only thing I have left to say is to announce the winner of the book giveaway, which is Helen Hopkins. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you, Mark, again. Gracious host. Congratulations. <laughs>